All right, so we're uh, this is our first time doing this talk. Uh, so um, kind of I guess buy, buyer beware. Um, and uh, we'll do our, I think what we'll start to do is give you a little context of where the company is today. So kind of like the stuff you'd see optically in the news, and then we'll go into all the mess behind that. I think that starting a company, it's kind of like a, it's like a duck on the water. It looks calm above the surface and underneath you're frantically paddling. Um, so we'll start with the duck part and then we'll go to the paddling part and, and give some context there. Um, so with that, uh, what are we actually doing? So I think you guys in this program, I'm sure are very aware of this, robots are just fundamentally poised to change so much. Um, I think when you look, really the, the specific thing underlying that is that with computer vision, suddenly you can build stuff that can move around, perceive stuff and manipulate things. And it can do those things outside of a warehouse or a factory. And at the same time, those things are really, really, really hard to do. Uh, and so I think we're, we're, early, we're in like the first inning of this journey towards robots doing a whole host of different tasks in outdoor spaces. And with that stated, uh, you also have this other opposing dynamic, which is that farmers can't get people to work in the field. So if you're, if you're a laborer in California today and you wanna punish your kids for failing a, a class, one way that you will oftentimes punish your kids is by bringing them to work with you and having them go into a field at five in the morning and work from dawn till dusk at 110 degrees. We've seen that time and time again, uh, you know, very, very literally in the field over the past couple of years. Um, and then there's a real cost to that as well. When people are, you walk around the outside of the grocery store, all of the fruit, vegetable, and nursery crops are incredibly labor intensive. Uh, typically north of half of revenue actually flows to labor in those spaces. So there's a real, very real cost of labor in those products. And then this point's always difficult to kind of make with, depending on the audience, but within agriculture, half of revenue is livestock and half of revenue is crops. So within crops, two thirds of the revenue pool is corn, wheat, and soybeans. And that stuff is incredibly mechanized. It's where all the large companies like John Deere, Case New Holland, et cetera, make all of their margin. The other third of crops, all the stuff that is sold around the outside of the grocery store is not mechanized. It's where 90% of people work, but they do a whole host of different tasks. And so robotics companies going into those spaces, go into those spaces because there's lots of labor, but that labor does a ton of different things. So it's really, really difficult to automate things within the space because you're inherently going after these kind of small niche markets. Um, and so with that statement, We've had the perspective that robots are the answer to a lot of the labor problems out there. Um, and, and our approach has been kind of weirdly different. And it kind of, it seems, it seems perhaps smart in retrospect, but it's been very much an evolutionary journey figuring out bit by bit. I mean, when people think about robots, the traditional approach for robotics and I guess, let's build, go build a robot to take berries, let's sell it as a service. And let's build something that we, because it's so complex and difficult to do, we are going to have to operate it for our customer base. And the approach that we have taken, and, and build it in such a way that you might have to change around the way your production system is. Um, the approach that we have taken is, is just weirdly, it, it, it seems similar to many things, but is weirdly different. Um, so what we have is a product called Burrow. Um, I would describe it if you're familiar with like Disney's Wally. It's kind of like Disney's Wally for work outdoors in a 1.0 format. So what does it actually mean? It's a computer vision based autonomous ground vehicle. Um, each one, Terry will, Terry and I will argue over this many, many times. Each one's processing something north of two terabytes of imagery per hour of runtime between 12 different cameras. And it's using that imagery mostly to move through the world and then to, to carry heavy things alongside people while doing it. At the same time, logically, if you imagine a world where many, many robots are doing a variety of things outdoors alongside people, it's likely that those systems begin as a cart carrying stuff alongside people, but are layered on over time to do progressively more things. So we're, instead of starting with the hardest of hard, hard, hard technical problems, i.e. let's go pick fruit or let's go weed a field, we are starting with a still very, very, very hard problem, but a problem that is more, uh, more present across many, many different uses. And on top of which you can layer a lot more behaviors. So with that description, um, I think this, this is kind of the overall narrative we're pursuing, beginning with a vehicle that carries heavy things alongside people and then layering on more capabilities with it over time. 
And what we're what we're doing today is typically actually this. When I say today, um, like literally right now, we have about like 150 to 200 systems running. They're mostly doing this exact task. So they're navigating from a pack table where you've got a bunch of people packing fruit into a row then traveling down a row and going back. And they're doing the, like a million different iterations of the same behavior while supporting like six to eight people per vehicle. Each one of those six to eight people are on the low end 10%, on the high end 50% are productive. And so you're offsetting one to two people per day per robot, which has a really, really punchy ROI. And oh, by the way, if you can do this well, then you can logically do a bunch of other things. And so what we have discovered, which is a on, on the commercial and sales side is awesome. And on the engineering side can be a bit of a nightmare, um, is that when you build a vehicle that any laborer in the field can operate, they start using it one way and come up with like a zillion use cases that you didn't envision initially. And oh, by the way, a field in one part of one region is very different than the same type of field in another part of the same region. And so today we have customers running them as carrying vehicles in vineyards, carrying vehicles in nurseries. We have a bunch going in as carrying vehicles in solar panel sites of all things. We have things doing tow trailer towing in nurseries. We have vehicles that people are mounting, uh, unloading devices for solar panel installation sites. We have a customer running six as guard dogs in their depot yards at night. And so it's just like the, the tentacles of the use case keep going in these funky directions around the basic premise of moving around, perceiving stuff around you and then manipulating things or performing as a platform for that. And within all of this, what we've been trying to do is narrow our focus and mostly doing what we're really at our core of mobility companies, so building good, safe mobility that can carry and tow things alongside people but building that in such a way that other things could be layered on top of it as well. Um, so that's a little bit like the premise of the product. These are, these are some of the ways that we might think about marketing. So I think um, today we, we are mostly selling to table red vineyards. We're going into nurseries. We're going into berries. We're doing some scouting in vineyard type applications and our customers continue to pull us into other areas. And uh, with all of that kind of abstract terminology, these are just all images of things running last week as well. So this is like last week in the field. We have a ton of these things running in paid commercial use. What I, what I will say is I think when, when you see a lot of like robotics imagery of things in use, it's very frequently like super, super clean. You'll notice that our stuff is like dirty. It's messy. It's getting sprayed every day. Like people are using this stuff very consistently right now and then putting more and more capabilities on top as well which is really, really cool for us to see because more use means, more use means more growth ultimately. Um, although every, every, every additional unit you sell and additional use you have to do creates a whole host of challenges for an engineering team to deliver on. Um, and then I'll, so I'll, I'll touch you again, like probably optimistic narrative of the company. We'll get shortly to how we started and how we found Terry, how I found Terry, I guess. Um, so today we have a 200 robots running, smallest customer has around two, largest has around 60 machines with a single customer. Um, that number might seem small. I think it's actually on the high end of robotics and ag today. So like there are roughly 450,000 tractors sold annually in the US. That's like just tractors ignoring all this other stuff. And there are only probably like maybe 2,000, maybe 1,000 to 2,000 robots in total sold into ag in the US comprehensively. So that the market is like, so early stage, so nascent, nothing standardized has emerged yet, but it will be enormous in time if you kind of read the tea leaves or some of the macro factors. And uh, on the team side, 32 person team, we're right down the street from here. We have an office in California. We also have an office here. Most of our engineering actually takes place here. Um, the field team is mostly a group of guys that speak really good Spanish and also understand engineering and are able to like support the customer. Um, and uh, we have raised about $21 million to date, backed by Toyota uh, Ventures, S2G, and a number of other like you know, pretty, pretty reputable firms within the space. What I will say is that the we'll talk through the, the journey of investing. I think it's frequently that you'll see a slide like this and be like, wow, like how do they do this so fast? And there's a lot of color underneath how long it takes to raise money that you don't typically hear about, um, but it definitely is a journey to raise funding for sure. Um, and then we'll do roughly like around one and a half million dollars in revenue this year, um, which again is pretty small in most other industries, but in robotics, especially in ag, 
is, is towards the top end of the market today. Um, so with that, I'll touch very briefly on how we started and then hand it over to Terry. Um, yeah, so, so I guess any, maybe any questions as well from anything we've described thus far? Um, you said you have code for your economy. Uh, what, what does that mean? It means that our, our typical, so we have roughly like 1,600 to 2,000 people using the systems today. Those people um, all speak Spanish and are typically, they're, they're laborers in the field. So nobody is touching a laptop near these things. They're grabbing them off of a trailer. There's a touchscreen interface and a bunch of relatively simple buttons. And people are able to learn within a matter of maybe five or 10 minutes how to use the system in the application that we go into. Um, so the the we're oftentimes doing things you might do in a lab here, but doing them in a way where there's like an interface and a system that anybody can use to, to use them. Um, do you have a video use? I think to us, I, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious. It's yeah, the, um, there's the one towards the end of this. I can, I can, why don't we, why don't we, what, we'll, we'll circle back to that in time if that, if that makes sense. So, um, so they, this, is, this is where like maybe the record scratch slide where we then go into like how it begins. So, um, Briefly, on my background, grew up on a working farm, grew up west of here. For me growing up, I love like machinery and technology. And what I hated was any task where I had to get out of a tractor cab and go do something by hand. And uh, like I want to like I want to push buttons. I want to have like 150 horsepower, just like go fast and get stuff done. I don't want to do manual labor ever. Um, and on my family farm, which is fruit, vegetable, livestock production, like 95% of work is outside of a cab doing something by hand. Uh, and so uh, got an MBA, got a business school, went to go work for a company called CNH, which is Deere's largest competitor. Um, and while there, part of my role was selling and marketing stuff to farmers. And part of my role was looking at autonomy companies from an acquisition perspective, which for that company was mostly tire kicking without actually buying, because very few things at that point in time were actually real. And so from this, idea number one became building a robot to pick up dead chickens. Um, and you can, you can unpack this if, a, you know, a bit more that this this is a real problem in a way. Um, it's not an attractive or inspirational problem at all. It's that uh, so so if you're if you're growing chickens today, a large portion of them die, uh, and you as a farmer have to walk through a house every single day and pick up ones that have deceased. Uh, and so that idea was incredibly hard technically. You had to localize and move through the world. You have to perceive whether a chicken is alive or dead, and then you have to actually manipulate it. And oh, by the way, it's a concept that no venture fund wants to touch because it's not like a fun, inspirational thing. It's like the dull, the dirty, the dangerous, kind of the, the gross, if you will. Um, and so from that, um, I pivoted to this concept of building a vehicle to carry heavy things alongside people because there were so many instances I could identify where you could envision how something that was carrying heavy stuff alongside people could begin collaboratively today and over time do stuff more akin to a robot picking up a chicken, et cetera. Um, and at that point in time, this was, was um, just getting into the idea, had quit my job, was living in an inflatable mattress with a slow leak in it at my parents' house, um, had an unheated, like was working out of an unheated barn with like people that I was finding on Craigslist to work. Um, and uh, was also going to pitch competitions and losing them a lot. Um, I have a, I have a folder on my uh, I have a folder on my laptop with just like pitch events, like like decks for pitch events, and it's at least fifteen decks label where it's like just like name of the event lost, name of the event lost. Like I've lost so many pitch events, um, and and at the same time, so you go to these events, pitching this concept, people are passing you because like, you don't have a product, you don't have a team, you don't have anything to show other than like an idea. Um, and at the same time, you're running out of money because you, you, need, you need to get on a plane and fly out and go do those things. Um, and so from this, it pretty quickly was realizing that, that robots are absurdly hard to build, um, that, that, and they're hard to build for a whole host of different ways. Well, one, just like to build the thing, you have a piece of hardware, you got to get it up and working. Separately, localizing, perceiving, and manipulating are all insanely hard. Beyond that, to get people to believe in investing in you, you have to show a huge vision for where the company is gonna go because you have to justify them taking a ton of risk in this crazy, crazy early stage idea. Um, and then finally, you to really raise money, you have to have a good customer demo, but to do a good customer demo, you really have to raise money. So you're in this kind of catch 22 that's pretty circular. 
And so from this, uh, I was like, okay, don't have people, don't have money. And it became, I can probably solve the getting people side before I can solve the getting money side. And so I started reaching out. I probably, I'm sure that some that's people- also in the too, that's, uh, Yeah, also one of those catch me. So no money, no people, no people, no money. And how, people typically need money. So how do you, how do you get through that? Um, so I, I, at that point, made a list of, you guys, you guys have a variety of um, GRASP lab websites that include lists of every single student in the GRASP lab. And I guarantee probably some people in this room have received a cool email from me four or five years ago, if you were here. Like I emailed every single person within the program. Hey, I'm this insane guy. I live outside of Philadelphia. I have no money. I have this idea. Do you want to come work with me? And that did not work with most people. Um, Work with a couple and the battle queue up Terry. Uh, that's, that's how I thought Terry. Team me up for that one. Yeah, so, yeah. No. Um, yeah. Yeah. I thought about that also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess that's probably probably not the right way to set up. So what so found Terry and found also from my other co-founder before. Um, and, and what I will say about Terry for so, so Terry for one was coming from this other uh, live startup called Cozy, which was which was in kind of maybe a tenuous time at that point. Um, <clears throat> Separately, I think Terry, I don't think, no offense meant by this comment, I don't think that people, that engineers in the space do the best job of marketing their skills. So it's very frequently that like people will be, they, they, <laughs> people have a LinkedIn and it'll feel like, hey, I went to this school and like I'm here now in this program and that's kind of it. And Terry, I think was somewhat some of that like, uh, at a startup, went to this school, that's kind of it. And like start talking to Terry, like, oh, this is a guy that's like, has, has worked within the stack within another startup, has a PhD from one of the best programs on the planet, does vision-based localization and can uniquely do the hacking early on. And like this became evident really, really quickly initially. So I think it's, I think at an early stage when you're looking for co-founders, you're basically looking for people that are as crazy as you. And some of the lunacy might seem negative in the future. It's people that kind of share the vision and the idea. So, so with that, hopefully that's a better Better, uh, yeah, and go to you. Painting the full picture, painting the full, hopefully, yeah. full of picture. We can switch, yes, absolutely. I'll send over to the side. Um, early stage. So, I've broken up, I guess, the, the last four years or so into three stages. Um, so the, the early stages, you know, I've met Charlie for a bunch of guys just trying to figure out. Um, so, Charlie has this great idea. So, we meet, I meet Charlie and says, yeah. really sold on the idea. Um, he can tell really quickly, like, like Charlie's just a tenacious guy. Um, like really good background, just kind of solid, uh, kind of go get it. You can, you, you can just tell that. So it's like, you know what? I've worked at a startup before, but we'll give it one more go. So um, this is kind of our founding team, myself, the board, uh, Dennis and Charlie. And together, we kind of put, you know, all these bits of different ideas and Charlie's kind of idea of this utility, utility robot that you can, um, Kind of just build up these uh, autonomous workflows with, and just kind of put that together. Uh, and this is kind of what we came up with. So, and Terry, just to just to like, so on this, you know, yeah. every slide we're talking to like kind of cash on hand, um, and a little bit of metrics around. So at this stage, so when I met Terry and Joel, we had like uh, roughly two hundred grand in the bank, maybe like maybe two months of runway, three months of runway, so like very very cash buys time. And and you need a pretty significant team early on to buy or to, to move quickly, but you also need cash to buy time. And so so that that theme will weave through these slides to give you a little context of like the energy and the urgency at an early stage to deliver stuff fast. Yeah. Um so kind of as, as you saw in this the earlier slides, Charlie's like really good at queuing up these these pitch events um, and all these sorts of things. So we he had kind of this um this this event plan for was it Salinas? Yes, I was a Forbes Act Tech Summit. Yes, Salinas, California. And, and we were going to build a robot, ship it there, and demonstrate what we had. And this is kind of like a little bit when we're in the hacky phase. So I'll show a little bit of the hacky phase, but maybe a little bit about. I'll go into this briefly. Like, what, what is my role? So um, I, I, was, I wasn't initially the CTO of uh, Borough. Uh, so Dennis had, had the CTO title um, when he left in 2020. I took over as CTO. Um, but that, you know, if I look through it, that doesn't, might change the title, but I don't know if it really changed the role. Um, and so like, what is my role as a startup? And I think this is sort of the list of things that I am or have been over the years. 
just as a startup. So technologists are basically kind of the core of what I do is building out technology, but kind of bring it from, you know, what, you know, what's possible to something which you can actually build as a, build as a product. So how do I turn something like a simple teach repeat paradigm into a product that people can use? So we talk a bit more about that. Um, so architect, particularly on uh, software, I've done a lot of hardware design as well, particularly early on software developer, um, still made a lot of code. So I have to commit to the last four years. Um, and then kind of, you know, rest of, rest of that, salesman, you know, Charlie might get some comments on how good a salesman I am, but I tend to have conviction in what I do. When I have that conviction, hopefully that comes across. Uh, so you might say reasonable there. So it's all these things. I wouldn't say I'm 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 good at some of them, I'm definitely not really good at others. But I think as a startup, you kind of typically have to, you know, fill the gap. Uh, so over time, those are sort of roles that I've been filling. Um, so initially, when I arrived, this is kind of what Bro looked like. Um, so it was this device that kids would really like playing with in the park. And you know, kind of having having a, this this pitch event that, hey, let's let's kind of build this out. Um, we kind of put this a few ideas together. So making a four wheel drive, um, adding a camera, and then developing I guess two of the core technologies, which really were sort of the foundation for not not just now, but well, like very early on, the two the two building blocks were this ability to teach route and retrace the route. The other one was to follow a person. Um, and then stitching those two together, you can get these really dynamic um, kind of, and really easy to set up workflows. You have this, it's what we call the pop of autonomy. So these digital train tracks, which you uh, create throughout any environment which you, which you wish. And so that, that looks a bit like this. So I found this is the, the very early prototype wise and everything hanging out of it that's welded by hand. Um, this is for uh, navigating autonomously around the office at NextFab. And this is the first time it did it. Uh, so that was, that was a pretty exciting moment. Hey, this is actually possible. And so this is about month three or so of me you know, starting with the company. This was actually after the ag tech show. We had a kind of rudimentary implementation of this, which didn't really work. Kind of have to like- It worked on TV. It worked on TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd see like drifting up. It was. You know, not really a full kind of six star uh, slam type thing. It was more like bearing and heading base. So it would kind of drift and drift up to the post. And you know, someone would be like, is that kind of going off the post? It's like, no, no, I think it's a uh, well, question. So, so, you know, it's a, there's a, is it kind of an art to, to selling the thing that you're building? It's like, you believe it's going to work. Um, so, so selling is the truth well told. It's, it's, you have the path to getting it right. Uh, but you just haven't quite got there yet. And I think that's that's a lot of what a startup is. Um, yeah, so selling, uh, I'll show the post and follow. And actually, so while Terry's print, so prior to Terry working on this, I had a 2D LiDAR based person following vehicle that I couldn't distinguish between like a person and a post. And so I would take it to Manhattan, uh, I would unload it from a piece of plywood that I was using as a ramp, and I would walk it to like uh, different investors on the sidewalk and you basically have this like weird contraption following behind you randomly swapping you as the person to like a pole or some other random person nearby you and I, again you take that to like investor events and try to pitch with it so this might might maybe that's look incredibly sophisticated today but like at the time was it's like you can actually build something someday in like yeah. a really functional way i was surprised you had an e-stop on it <laughs> at this time were you being paid or were you just interested in a project and wanted to work for them? um yeah so no yeah, so charlie had some funding available i think from his own savings and he had an accelerator funding as well I, a, little, a little bit like scrappy stuff early on yeah uh nobody is paid anything close to market yeah like, so like they could pay, they could pay rent they could be okay you know, that's yeah. kind of how we negotiated yeah um and you had finished your phd at this point or yeah yeah, so this is about two years after I came. Cool. Yeah, so having worked at Cozy, Cozy was the company kind of spun out of, of Grasp. Or was it Grasp? Yeah. 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 Um, and so the intention there was to basically to bring a, a robot into, you know, like 
grocery stores and kind of big box stores. And you could uh, do like inventory monitoring, things like that autonomously. Um, so like a lot of the same concepts definitely apply. And see, and, and see in some of the videos, we end up kind of going up and down these rows and that's a lot of what we do. And if you're in like a Walmart or something, it's just up and down rows. So I was like, is this just the same thing? Um, but it, it, it got different quite quickly. Is there some kind of suspension on this or is it like, how does that work? Yes. So, uh, so the, the hard thing for us was the, the autonomy and the software. It's like to get this thing to move in a way that we want is that's all software. Um, so we were like dead, dead simple on, on mechanical. mechanical side. Yeah. Um, so you can think of like a clear path pesky, like maybe you're familiar with you know, that or how it works. It's like, it's the same idea, but doesn't carry 500 pounds. It's like, we want something to do that. It can travel to the 10 miles. So it's like, we want something similar, but actually you know, can take payload. So it's, it was kind of by necessity. And then as soon as you start designing a suspension and um, all the complexities, it's like time to build goes yeah. up. So it's like, what's the fastest thing that we can get that can demonstrate the autonomy, not to demonstrate um, maybe like a sort of robotic system as it were. I think it's the ag vehicles and construction vehicles that almost never have suspension. Yeah. I think it's going to less than 25 miles an hour, especially when you have like big chunky tires. Yes. Um, or it's they're not typically in the cities. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those, the, two, the two building block components I talked about, this is that was kind of the next few months for us. So between you know June of 2018 and sort of the end of the year, it's it, how do we present this in such a way that we can sell this idea? Like, um, and it was partly, you know, going to investors, doing pitch events, um, but also Charlie doing a ton of reach out to, to growers as well and saying, yeah, but I've got this thing, um, finding out people are interested, uh, which we call the early adopters. I talk a bit about the early adopters and why they're important. So, um, so it's a little bit of fun as well. So we, we went to Central Park, uh, to the center bottom there. So I don't know if that was totally allowed or not, we were driving through around Central Park. It was, it was not allowed. Actually, I actually posted on, was there a company Twitter event that we were going to be in some other park in New York City? I think which one of them was. And then I got a I got a direct message and a call to like do not show up. <laughs> <laughs> and so we just like randomly walked into Central Park, just like and just did it without telling anybody basically. Yeah, so where I'm email averse, Johnny's the opposite. So we could fit, I guess. Um and then you know we had the invested by next job as well. They had a good variety on it. Um that's on the right is Charlie pushing forward through the rain. Um, the reason he's pushing it is because it's turned off because all the wires are exposed. And so, you know, uh, this is not this is the head of Harvard management company's endowment because most of their ag tech investment. So, like, yeah. people, people that were pretty serious would play with this stuff. Yeah, just really have a nice thing about it. Nice. And so, this yeah. is us kind of the ag tech show, which we uh, got to find out. Um, what was that one? Uh, that was the uh, support ag tech event. Uh, yeah. which we ended up winning uh be like 75 grand out of um, yeah, so it's, it's like yeah. you know, it's like two months one month maybe. so it's a lot of that it's finding money to turn basically what we have is like this thing with wires sticking out of it to something which you could actually convince someone is could be a part of um, and that's kind of the next stage of it is uh, so we got a little bit of cash a bit more cash in the bank um and so we build a few more. So let's build or build four or five more robots and kind of ship them to different parts of California. And like for the next few months, it's just discovery of like, okay, we have people interested in autonomy. They don't, they don't know a little bit about, much about it. We're trying to figure it out. Like, where does it work? Where does it not work? So just a ton of kind of throwing stuff against the wall and see what sticks. Just a lot of that. I think that's, that's kind of the, the very approach that we've taken. Uh, did, did it still follow random people? Yeah. Um, we certainly had had our share of that, but at this point, it was a far more robust implementation. So uh, image based, good, much better tracking. Um, uh, so yeah, a, mu a much more like a thousand times better. Although we also were starting to have more machines, and so as you have more machines. They might perform better, but you also have more machines doing more weird things because you have a broader tail. 
So, and, and I the, the other the other concept of mutual that should be woven into it, especially is that as you think, uh, there's this framework for there's, there's a start called the Lean Star. It's actually a book for the for starting up company called the Lean Star. I highly recommend that anybody in terms of needs it. Um, I think one one the two parallel possible periods. One to figure out like what's hard and what's achievable on the technology side. The second part is figure out what is the customer actually need want. And that's a very high iteration cycle. And the appeal of a robot in a way is that you can you can have the same piece of hardware provided it works really well. You can iterate really quickly on the software. And so we were trying to try to build one piece of problem but then iterate really, really fast with customer using it in a variety of applications that we have probably recommended or create value for. Yeah, so an example of that, where in the table grade for an ATS, yeah, so you've got these long rows, maybe up to 600 feet. Um, and we, we were in there saying, hey, we've got this robot, we want to see if we can help out the pickers, let's put, put the fruit on it and, and shuttle it back. Uh, and then this, what we had set up was you'd, you'd spend about 10 minutes walking the row to down different rows to train a particular route to get shuttled back between two points. And one that showed us, hey, this is viable. Like it comes back, it just goes from one place to the other, brings back fruit. This could work. Yeah, that, that was kind of like the bit of a light bulb moment for us. We're like, this is a viable thing if we get it working. But how do we remove that 10 minutes of time that it takes to set up? Um, so that's where we, the invention of road following game, uh, Magnet can speak to a lot of that. So she developed, she developed that for the robot system and it's still running actually. So it works pretty well. Um, yeah, so we, we have this sort of uh, autonomous mode where you can actually just follow a row crop uh, without any kind of prime mapping. And that takes your setup down from like 10 minutes to like 30 seconds, because most of the time is spent moving down that long road. Are you trying to avoid GPS? Or, uh, so it's a good question. So in this, in this iteration, we were entirely. Um, yeah, so this iteration was like, we have, we have vision, we can build visual maps. Um, we're selling this thing that we don't need GPS. It's, it's a trillion dollar industry you don't want to be involved with. But how can we do this without GPS was certainly the vision. Um, we'll get a little bit to how, how kind of we, that kind of turned on its head uh, at some point. But um, so off of that, doing a lot of the stuff um, that kind of got us through the uh, seed fund. So having raised a bit more money, we could actually start building up a product, how do we turn this into a product? So identifying the things like row following we needed, um, and then you know, addressing some things on the hardware side, autonomy, software, building user interface, uh, all that sort of thing. Do you want, so one thing, it could be a few, so you go back to, it's like metric wise. So around roughly 400 investors reached out to at that point, uh, at least 50, yeah, 15 to 20 pitch events lost. And then we actually, we were, we would re-win events that we had previously lost and raise that funding. So it's like it's definitely it's a grind to raise funding, but if you wear people out, <laughs> eventually you come through. It's kind of like you know we're, we're making progress, we have a real thing, starting to get some taste of it. That people people tend to believe in progress when they see it. It's not no, it's just no now. It, 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 exactly, no yeah. doubt. So um, and this 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 pretty much S two G, which is the Walton Family Zach Tech Fund, is one of the most active active funds in the U.S. Um, which like took a, a, a real risk on us early on as they usually do the deploy so far. Uh, they're in uh, ag construction in tech, pretty multifaceted. Um, so you have a bunch of areas, although very, they're, the, they're the most active ag tech, but, but have a, a fund that cuts across many spaces. Um, so the next big goal for us was to turn this proof of concept of prototype into a, into a product or a real thing that adds value and that people can use. Um, so what do you do when you do that? You build 10 of them. Um, so we built 12, we built 12 of these, which are Gen 5, yeah, five, yeah. Gen 5, um, put them in a box, sent them to uh, blueberry growers in California and said, hey, we can, you know, we'll set this up, it's, it's going to work. Um, so that unfortunately did not go very well. So um, again, it's it's still you know we, there are situations where it works well, situations where it doesn't work well. Things like a lot of what we're doing was was just 
getting in front of customers, in front of users, uh, getting feedback on it. Like we know it's like we, we know it works 50% of the time, but for that 50%, does it add value? Can people, you know, is it is it something people buy into? Um, and that was, you know, that's kind of a grind from the technology side. Like you're, you're constantly iterating, you're constantly resolving small issues, you're adding things here and there. Like day to day, it's like, I'll, I'll write code at midnight or 2 a.m. that we're gonna try all the next day. Like that's, that's not something we can ever do now, but, um, that's you know that's just kind of where it was. It's it's like you, you needed to make changes that quickly in order to get that feedback. Um, so yeah, there's there's always the bloopers real. So autonomy is just it, autonomy is hard. It's how do we get your know, robot to see things, understand the world, and then navigate uh, appropriately. Um, who knows what that is. Driver. Yes, that's a motor driver. And so we have a boat MOSFET. Um, <laughs> so a lot of those. A lot of those. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot. Um, so that was like an early version of the motor driver, early motor driver we used. Uh, how many pennies of motor drivers do we have so far? Uh, I think zero. So NCT was so it's NCT 236. Yeah. MOSFET would burn. We had like this huge smoke burn on the Shkoya floor. Yeah. Uh, we used a lot of them. And then now we switch to a vendor having a single failure with them at all. Yeah. Since, since the new switch, um, yeah, but took that took us a while to figure some of these things out. Yeah, particularly in trying to optimize for cost, it's like, yeah, it's, at some point it's you got you got to make those trade offs. Yeah. Um, and it was about this time you know, we're running these miles, we're doing these workflows, and um, we we got to start tracking your metrics. Like, so here we're tracking fault, basically what what goes wrong. Um, so we're trying to get this workflow from A to B. It's doing some row following. It's doing some kind of uh, T to P type stuff. In that workflow, what happens or what goes wrong? So by doing this, we record it run by run. We so it went from here to here. What happened? And kind of describe it like down to a lot of detail. Um, and then doing that, we get to sixty faults per mile. So we find sixty issues of things that go wrong before we cover a mile autonomously. Um, so this can this might. Actually, help explain some of the maybe just some of the, the these, grid that's needed for this. I think these things aren't even I think the stuff the irony of what we typically do is everyone looks at their sermons like this looks really easy. Like people constantly say this is easy, this is doable, everybody can do it. And then you go to field with really, really smart people and you initially have 60 failures in one mile one time. It's like well, either we're not smart, which doesn't seem likely, or it's actually a much harder problem than people understand the vision. And so like Recognizing that a weed is a weed, you should drive through it, and you should drive through the crop around it. Not swapping from person to something that looks like a person, or a hat on the ground, not swapping as a person. Not getting, um, uh, it's been community nods for a period of time. Who were the nods? Yeah. Yeah. Nods, you 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 would nods on your localization stack or flash or something. Yeah. So we're seeing like, I mean, you know, a drive who's trained would like get stuck randomly and say nods on the screen and just be like, why did we do this thing? Yep, filters are um, putting that. Yeah. yeah. So there's so all these fucking things like that that come up. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So off that, really, our, our goal in the early stage is to, is to kind of build a, a device which, which kind of embodies our vision of, of a product and technology. Um, but then also to figure out how to turn that into a product. So it's really getting in front of it. A lot of different people, a lot of environments, just figuring out like what works, what doesn't. Um, it just grew to spend months doing that. Um, and so lessons learned from what is hard. Um, so it's when I started my PhD, first chat with my professor, he sits down and says, robotics is really, really, really hard. And that was the first lesson he told me. It's, it's true. So um, other lessons, we probably built too many too quickly. Uh, so you probably don't need well to figure out what breaks and what doesn't. Um, but this is it's like you don't know. In some ways, if your baby is sitting in one robot, you don't get a sense of what breaks. If you have three out there doing stuff, like it, stuff that goes wrong comes back to you quickly. Um, so that's it's it's sort of a maybe to that is that like by trying to do more than you think you can, you work up very quickly the gap, the deficit. Um, Proof of concept is further from product than when you imagine. I think that's that's probably just like every every product or every startup probably has has this. Is you're you're always a bit further than you think you are. Um, doing it poorly is required to do it well, and this is part of just like getting in front of customers, getting in front of uh, 
people invested, people you know, people that have different ideas about the product, where it can be used, just really getting it out there and getting feedback. And uh, yes, yeah, so you're never going to do it well until you get that feedback. And uh, tracking performance or product metrics is only impossible. So really getting a sense of what you're trying to do with the product. Like what are the things that are important to measure? Uh, so as soon as you can, as soon as you can, you want to be able to measure um, those things. You want to be able to know how your product is improving. Uh, and then stick to your principles. So, you know, you, you get a lot of, um, you know, a lot of things go wrong and, you know, people will say no, but, you know, you stick to your principles, you stick to your vision, you'll start to get it working. You'll have a win here. Someone's going to come back and say, hey, that looks much better than it did two months ago. So stick to your principles um, and have conviction in that you can do it. So next phase of getting traction. Um, so this is, you know, going through this iteration of um, fail and repeat uh, cycles is, well, we, you know, there's a ton of stuff we learned coming out of running 12 robots, you know, with growers trying to get them to use it and that sort of thing. And it's, it's a little bit hacky here, but what it's ready kind of very, very quickly solve some of the, the core problems that we have. So one is, yeah, so you had a question about GPS. Well, actually, it turned, it, you know, so at the time, it turns out vision is really, really difficult to go outdoors. And to a logic, to a logic extent, it helps you, uh, but it tends to be brittle and it kind of tapers off over time. So we made a decision to add GPS. Um, you see like two cameras set up there. Just by adding two cameras, we can increase the field view, increase the safety, improve the ability to see, see things and be able to identify things around you. And so really, this is, this is very much the main approach. It's not a clean setup, it like does a work enough. What is the what is the least amount of work I need to do to show that this is the thing that works or not? It's not clean, but it tells you. Um, so this was around 2020. Our goal was to build and ship 20 robots, updated GPS, two cameras, um, kind of we've added button box front and back so we don't interact with just the touch screen anymore it's like to operate this thing it's literally just three buttons forward back stop um, so you can imagine like an elevator well simpler than an elevator it's one to go that way one to go that way it's like where does the fruit need to go um and this is kind of look like this is our uh, warehouse and next fab. this is our pristine clean pristine. Our certified manufacturing so yeah everything's nicely put away shell label and all that sort of thing um, probably was it like midnight or one i suspect but. so it's amazing we actually got 20 robots with all the parts in there shipped out so so there's uh between 2020 and 2021 like that what's that no Quality check is like somebody in a field game of lightest and square. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, like, yeah. talking about quality and that sort of it's like, it's, we, that's a lesson. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a lesson. Yeah. And, and then, like, really, like, small, small lessons that are like, yeah. To shield connections. Yeah. Uh, aluminum that is unpainted does not disappear too well. Putting a fan in something sucks in dust and moisture, and some of that dust can have sulfur in it, which is sulfuric acid. Like, there's a bunch of, it's a lot of like small lessons that you don't, you cannot envision those before you do it. But if you have to design something at some bar to figure out how to make it cook, it's just, it's just this weird irony of the huge cycles. Yeah, so it's these it's kind of weird numbers. It's not, let's build two of them. It's like you can build two and the two are going to work great. You build another one and the slight change in quality is going to cause a component to fail. Uh, you need to improve that. Uh, but doing two doesn't tell you that, doing 20 does. See, there, there are some things in just like variation and assembly or manufacturing or whatever it might be unit to unit that um, you don't get right will you know show something that you wouldn't have otherwise seen before um so i think I've, i don't have a too many slides between now and 2021 there's, there's a lot going on in those years but you know it was um similar kind of objective this was like our first time we we're like this is going to a customer it's going to be a product that's going to add value um so we hired Field support team, we've got Chris on our team, who's kind of head of sales, and Jared knows the that area really, really well. 
there are people that speak Spanish in the for the first time. So, like, if you, you're in Southern California, you don't speak Spanish, you do not talk with them. Like, you just can't. So, at this point, we still had a field sales support team and a field list on every single day. Uh, and then, as you, as you have more whisper down the line, you're probably, you're probably not working it. You're working here, it'll tell you in pretty linear terminology what's wrong with it. But an end user or somebody on your team who's a little less engineering based is telling you what's wrong with the dance. The robot is is dancing. What does that mean? Is it is the driver failed? Is the perception thing failed? Like what they so you get those kinds of descriptions. And as you have more, the descriptions become more and more divergent from the core thing that actually might be causing it. Um, I guess at this point we had, we had 20 robots running in the field daily in 2020, which which might seem like a small number but with a I guess we have a team of, of team nine of or so. That's actually that's three in California. Charlie's so, doing his best to go around yeah. and then so that's five and it's basically shipping in twenty shipping in trying to have to update and maintain twenty robots. So you yeah. you learn pretty quickly where again your gaps are. And and that's, they're in production use six to seven days a week for six months out of year. Yeah. Yeah. So your your goal here is to add value in a production setting. Whereas prior to this, it's we're just seeing if this if this is can work with the product. So this is really here's the thing, which is our MVP is viable. It requires a lot of support. It's very hands-on, but it's viable. Um, what are our lessons here? So building a company is hard. Um, so this is you know not just how do we build a uh, cool piece of technology. It's how do we start hiring a team, start hiring more engineers, hiring support personnel. Um, so that's that's kind of when my my first uh, this is hard, and not just from a technology point when it lived in. Um, that was the first time. <laughs> <laughs> might, might actually be the might, might be. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's like you did a lot of the a lot of the things that are hard on the company side where I was working in the Um they play to your strengths. And maybe this is this is maybe something which should be in a later lesson, which you know, these things you always should, should always learn earlier. But maybe you can learn uh, later. It's like you know, what where do you add value in the business? Is it Building stuff really fast. Is it in research? Is it managing? Like, is it hiring? It, what is the value that you bring to the company? Try and work that out, um, and then you'll be able to bring on people kind of uh, as your team to to um, uh, uh, to to kind of help out and um, kind of augment your own skills. Uh, scaling without sufficient resource can lead to firefighting. So as you look at the team size there, even until 2020 to 2021, it's still quite a small team size. So now we're trying to do a huge amount of things with the same engineering team. Uh, and so there are a ton more problems in terms of scaling and maybe not a lot on thinking of maybe some of the core architecture or the technology that we might we might need to develop at the time. Um, don't underestimate the importance of software engineering. So we're building a robot and we've got autonomy on it. Well, autonomy is software and you know that software has to get to a user. It has to push stuff to the cloud, we need cloud infrastructure. Um, so there's a huge amount in just the, the software engineering that goes into building an autonomous vehicle. Um, don't build 20 robots yourself. Uh, so we'll see in a few slides of us not, well, we try to not make this, that mistake in 2021, which with some success and uh, much improved that this year. So, but Jay, so that, that was that picture here. That was all in-house. So each one of these was built by hand. Um, the steel was all kind of formed by manufacturer, but all built by hand. So that was not fun. Um, being, being clear in the goals are imperative. So what are we trying to achieve at each stage? How do we communicate this with everyone on the team um, and get people aligned on direction? Uh, be very aware of tech debt you're creating. Um, so this maybe aligns with some of the other videos. Uh, and then kind of a, a playing to your strengths as well. Identify where you're making decisions and where you can hire people to make some of those decisions along the way with you. Um, and then you know, getting it to 95% sometimes just isn't good enough. Tech What's tech debt? <laughs> I'd say that's a very good question, actually. So every time you write a piece of code without with 
which is just solving a problem and you don't think how it is part of a product, that's tech debt. So it, basically you're, sol you're writing code to solve a very specific problem without thinking about how you're writing that code. Or it could be hardware, it could be wrapped prototyping. It's you're, you're building something which serves a very specific um, discovery outcome. You wanna learn something or you wanna demonstrate something. Uh, but it's not something which will allow you to expand on in a, a rapid way, which is sustainable. Um, That's really interesting because I feel like in a PhD or it's like research, you're building just as much tech debt as you want. It to be. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas it like now you're in, you have to switch gears and you have to actually think about the full product of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think there's a there's a place for it. It's like you got to just be intentional about it. It's like, I'm writing this code to solve this problem. I can't reuse it, but that's okay. Because I need to raise money in the next two months. And this, this code is going to get me that money. In two months, I'm going to have to discard it and rewrite it. That's okay. That's being delivered with your tech debt. Um, if you do that and then say, well, I'm going to reuse that code and build something else, and build something else. Well, now you've got four or five things, which now you can't fit them together. So you need to start thinking about what is the architecture? How does it? How does it how does it become safe? How does it become introspective? Does it follow a consistent architecture? Can people read it? Um, so all that sort of stuff. And so there's like three dimensions of, of uh, code quality. It's like uh, does the code work? Does it integrate with the product? And is it is it like fully tested and you know, fully integrated? So you have these three dimensions. So you have like a, a cute relationship between something working and something being like product ready. Like if it took five days to hack your way to something which shows it can work, it's going to take you 25 days to actually get something which is product ready. So that's kind of a curious thing. All right, to execute the vision. This is the space we're in now. Um, so this, I'll show there's a pretty dramatic leap here. So we've got 20 robots running. With a team of 11 jumping to 100 robots running with double the size of the team in about two or three months. Uh, so, this was this was a, a fun, maybe not so fun time for us, but uh, building many, many robots and then hiring the people to be able to support the development of those robots uh, was, was something we had to go through last year. And the, and at the end of COVID, um, So, so, it, so was, it, was, it, was, it was challenging. So like an ex existing team of like seven or eight people on the interest, like six people yeah. on the engineering side shipping uh, yeah, that's about a hundred systems into production use while also hiring a team around them and with customers using stuff in the meantime that, that have complaints every day about things that the things went really well. So you're, you're, you're kind of force feeding a furnace also yeah, constantly. A lot of that. Yeah. yeah. A lot of firefighting. Which can lead to fatigue and burnout at some point. So you have to figure out how to get over that. Yeah, but our goal was to, um, well, our, our goal was to to have the customers have a, a great time with the product and, and really see its value, and um, you know, we we did that. So so in doing so, raised um, raised a Series A uh, last year, and. That's put us in a kind of really good position in, in terms of resources um, and team size. And so this is kind of the next generation for and this is what executing the vision looks, for, looks like for us. So we have to a team size of about 33 total cap of about $21 million, 206 robots total. Um, and so we're talking about kind of the resources and kind of getting out that firefighting mode. This is this is kind of the next next step for us. So it's a new office. Lots of investment in kind of software and infrastructure uh, to be able to support that, and now the ability to uh, focus a lot more on kind of new technology as well. Um, so this is what our this was our, our warehouse uh, this year. So but this is what building 120 robots looks like. That's a pretty cool to see. And we're up to over 40,000 miles. Right. miles. Yeah, it goes up by three to four hundred miles. Yeah. Stuff. It's, it's like our stuff is in production just right now, um, which yeah. is pretty cool to see. 
Yeah, so this is uh, coming back to the point about measuring stuff. This is the output of measuring. So if, you, if you've started measuring really, really early on before you even think you have a product, then you can, you can track that progress over time. Um, it's nice to climb a mountain and kind of look back and see you know, how far you've come. So if you, don't, if you don't have that perspective, it can be, um, yeah, it can be kind of difficult if you don't kind of have that perspective. Um, just maybe to, to parse this, I, I don't I think you just yeah, you're honest, you see so many like cool things that people are building. And the cool thing is like very, very first stage, but actually make it sellable. It needs to work like a light switch every single time. It's got to be the same thing climbing very early. So what we have tracked is miles of use and that miles of use of the growth speeds vehicle and climbing more very early. And we're also tracking the number of miles per fault that the robot sees or that it, that it uh, they, they never tell you there's something wrong for a mile per run. And so at the moment, we're north of around 20 autonomous miles per user intervention. And then we have one person supporting every like 24 or 25 minutes or so. And so what we're starting to near the point where we can actually ship a robot without having a support person nearby. And that's the ultimately the end goal. If you get to that point, then you can scale and sell a lot of stuff more broadly. And that journey is a lot of hard things learn day to day to day, which is retrospect was really epic, but the day to day journey can be it's a, it's a really a marathon not a sprint. Yeah, so if you remember the, the 60 volts per mile slide, there was a it's a pretty cool time when you go, hey should we start recording this in miles per volt instead? Um, so that's a that was a pretty cool time. It's nowhere about 20 miles per volt per unit. So that's about two or three days or four days of runtime without without any intervention. A robot. Um, so a little bit in terms of kind of priorities and in, in terms of what I'm thinking about uh, in terms of the tech and vision of the company. Uh, we're already thinking about quality and execution. So that's coming about like back to a question of tech debt. It's like doing away with that, building a scalable system, um, building in place uh, validation and testing that makes sure that every time you ship a uh, new release, that that code works. Um, so if you ship code that has a semicolon out of place to 200 robots, you're going to have a bad time. Um, so then you've, you've got kind of the organization, the management processes, objectives, all this kind of organizational function, which is really, really important in ensuring people are tracking the right, towards the right stuff. Um, then you have the technology and product. This is new things, research, uh, thinking about architecture, how do you stitch different parts of your product together? Um, what is the vision? What tech can you build to unlock different different use cases? And so what can we get forward to do and how do we do that? So that's kind of really where I like my brain to live. And so that's maybe the tension, not a tension, but a synthesis between your like a, a, maybe a vice president of engineering who's taking a lot more of like the organizational stuff versus the CTO is very much more technology focused. Um, and that kind of depends company to company. It's something you can have a very organization focus focus CEO. So but that's kind of where I live. So conclusion, building autonomy stock that works alongside people is an iterative process where there are no silver bullets to help to fix our problems, only let one. Um yeah, then our <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, this is kind of what we were end of 2019, and it's where we're at today in terms of our teams. So lots happened fairly quickly, which is very exciting. And then this should be video for product previews to me. Um, so I think our 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 stuff is in production just right now, which is a, just a pretty cool thing to see. Um, so this is actually at least for actually last week. Um, so you got you know about uh, 1,800 people are actually using the products every day. And they have flags on them, uh, flags are so that trucks don't drive over them, um, which has happened uh, at times. Um, and uh, people name them when they're getting put in it. Uh, you'll notice there's a lot of big audio, you've got a lot of sound. Um, I think you explain actually the, the equipment sound. That's a somewhat funny story. Yeah, so we the, the sounds that Borough makes are kind of the first sounds we put on there. Went onto the internet to a free sound library, and found some sounds. And the pop is basically like a metronome. Every 0.5 meters, it makes this popping sound. And so, like, it ups the frequency when it goes faster. So, if you're like tick, 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 or just ticking along, it's like tick, 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 and you're like, oh, what's going on? Um, 
Uh, but that, that popping sound is from someone popping the finger. Thank you. Capacity? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, something yeah. like a lot. So uh, it's something like a thousand pounds. Sometimes too, it depends on like the service and the terrain. Um, typically quoting around two thousand pounds of like concrete, but that number goes down to you know, gravel or something like this. Uh, and what I will say too is like uh, if you hand if you hand like an F one fifty to somebody like a, like a pickup truck and say hey, it's going to make me carry half a ton, there are assumptions that can carry two tons, and then you have a safety factor. As a startup, initially, your assumptions that you say five hundred pounds, then the person needs to apply a safety factor and only go to that with half of that, and that's just not the way the world works. So like, what you say you can do, you should actually be able to do like two x that. Is a lot, of, and that applies I think, to to the hardware as well. Yeah. Um, are you looking at layoffs? Oh, good question. <laughs> uh, so it sounds really hard. So right right now, um, well, we approach this. We don't need slabs. So you can switch between a natural localization. Um, so it, it depends kind of entirely on your use case. So as we as we kind of investigating um, kind of new markets and new use cases, things like slab become more important. It's like well, my environment changes all the time, particularly if you're using vision and be able being able to kind of modify that on the fly. Um, so it's it's in, using kind of the teacher and P paradigm. It's like you tell them a way to go. Uh, then you know you can use that information then to build a map whenever it wants, either it's online or data. And then it can use that map subsequently to localize. So you know a few few tracks we're going down, something like multi-experience localization, um, lighting and varying landmarks, of ways of kind of robustifying yourself to. To lighting changes in that sort of thing. I have one question. So, like, localization is such a frustrating problem because it, it is one of the hardest problems in the space, but nobody that's not in robotics understands how hard it is. So, I think it's what if you're out in the open and you can see GPS using Sky being great, your people skill robot under canopy sometime, you have to use a ton of vision to actually get it working, but nobody appreciates how difficult that is to do. Um, when I was in when I was in Pittsburgh for summer I was um, I, I got to interact a bit with the um, one of the um, one, one of the engineers who does who also is involved in is like a bit high enough here to be involved in some hiring at NREC, the National Robotics Engineering Center. And what he said it's one of the questions he always asks in in interviews is why is slam hard? Uh, we're talking a lot about how how she's linked up with it. Are you basically selling a robotic service? Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, yes, the answer is so. Uh, I think in robotics, there's this notion of robots as a service. I think that that is a great way to do any demonstrations. I mean, we see this, I think it varies by each one. Once you saw it, it's a great way to do a demonstration. It is really, really, you do not want your team to be in the field at 5 a.m. every morning working with one of your customers. You want to have the customer do what they're really good at, which is bring it, put it into the operations front end. And so, what, the way we saw it today is more of a software as a service model where people purchase the hardware, they lease the hardware, they rent the hardware in some form, and that locks them into a recurring software fee that is like an annual contract. And so it's a there's a recurring portion of it, and there's a hardware portion of it kind of separate those. We're not selling it as a service per se, let's bring that straight to you. Um, and there's a lot of nuance to that question as well. Yeah, and, and like how do you see if I need to be changing it in those state um, so I feel like people keep it my, my opinion, this is like an opinion, is that people keep reinventing concepts that have long exist. I don't I don't think that this is going to be all that different than like a lot of the existing models. There's going to be some sort of distribution that we're selling on like this in hardware to the users. They'll be handling a lot of hardware problems. And then the autonomy company that's selling an integrated system with autonomy on top is likely to be selling a recurring software similar to Microsoft Office that runs on a piece of hardware that you as the farmer or the consumer might purchase. So that's the way I kind of envision it evolving. Um, but we're definitely early days. I think it will take 
there's no one right answer. I think that people bought buy people buy things in a variety of forms, and I think reality is being bought in a variety of things. So and you mentioned that the spaces you go or it's our Google Voice accounts, right? Okay. <laughs> How do you think we're going to the Parts that you over to tear. I, I'll, so I'll do. I'll do my best in the tear. And so on the on the product side, um, we're integrating stuff that's fairly off the shelf and then customizing it a bunch to get it working. In this case, so there's a hardware component and there's an autonomy component. You're basically inserting a vehicle that is online that's pushing a bunch of novelty back to you. And if you have one of those vehicles, you don't really see a lot of novelty, but if you have a network of those things, you're sucking back a lot of imagery and edge cases and kind of weirdness from the actual operation at a really, really big scale. Um, and so every single time we have, we have a fault preserved here, that's a ticket that's come back to us, a bag file has been pulled down to us, it's been tagged by the edge case, and then that is incorporated into our subsequent autonomy stack to rectify it. So I think that in a world where you know, there are no silver bullets we can only be able to identify only lead ones, you want to observe and absorb each fault case back into your stack and then rectify it. And anybody that wants to, anybody that wants to copy what you're doing will also have to do under 20,000 hours of operation with 40,000 miles across 200 vehicles to replicate it. In, in a world where there's no simulation set up. Seven of that, we do have like one utility patent file program. So we have done some of that work as well. Our software is copywritten. Um, and then I think there's some architectural stuff that maybe we could go into on the system itself to prevent people from pulling things off of it. Um, yeah, so the, the source is all compiled closed source. Uh, we currently work with customers that we know. So it's a little bit in terms of if you think about security, it's, it's a little bit of a relationship thing. It's perhaps priorities as a, as a startup. So if you're starting to sell to people you don't know, security becomes much more important. It's also, yeah, so as Charlie mentioned, there's a data mode. It's learning if you're, uh, you know, we're vision based with machine learning models, it's very data driven. So there's that. But also, as developers, you're encountering all these cases that you now have data to figure out how to solve. So you're learning more about the problems as developers. Um, and, you know, code being compiled is just difficult to reverse engineer. I think there's like stuff that you can reverse engineer you pattern, and stuff you can't reverse and engineer you don't. Because if you pattern it, then it can be reverse engineered. So thank you. I was saying, well, I think most of our customers, this is the first one they've seen. So it's pretty weird. Like you're you're in you're in you're in the center of California typically. You're not in a I, I had never seen a competitor I've never seen somebody around. Like that, I mean, that will happen at time. I've literally never seen somebody at any of our customers that we build a product that's similar. So I think it's pretty rare today, at least you run into somebody trying to replicate exactly what you did, although that will, of course, be wrong. So, yeah. Have uh, you published? We have not. So, uh, how much do you think your application uh, was? The first question is how how relevant was my PhD work to doing this? Um, I would say it was very relevant, but not immediately. I think you know working for Cozy for a year um, and really being like very hands on with a novel system and being able to apply it. I think like like often you you tend to be like in a PhD you kind of focus on your own work a lot and make you know a lot of the theory within that, but maybe don't know a ton about it. Um, like some other theory, um, but and then sort of being able to go and apply a lot of this stuff kind of really kind of hammers down the theory because you're starting to really experiment a little bit more in different ways. It's like suddenly you have to solve all these problems. Um, so I would say a lot in that it, get, it gave a good foundation, but I would say I've learned I've learned a lot more over the last 
um, you know, a few years than I have during my PhD. But I think having that foundation was really critical. Yeah. Um, and the second part of your question, I need to repeat it. Uh, so, uh, you explained the tech uh, level of anything, the hardest thing that could put out human noise. This is just really gonna do things that the right amount of difficulty for any kind of startup as it is. Um, so you mean putting it is, is putting a humanoid robot the right amount of difficulty? No, of course it's not. Yeah. yeah. Like what is the right amount of difficulty? Yeah. Uh, the least it, amount. When you're, yeah. you're saying you're saying relative to competition or, or just like yeah. like what's what's the right level of difficulty they might scale off the competition kind of function? Not really competition because there's not really competition right now. But I guess I guess I guess it's it's into a life of North Face. Then you can build into a library product. You can build into a product. So I think our philosophy through and through is, is abs the absolute simplest thing you can do that you can then turn into a product. So, I mean, it's like you saw the two building blocks. It's we can follow first, we can learn roots. Um, the simplest building blocks. But to do those reliably, that's, you know, that's, you, you talk, you sort of going into like cutting edge state of the art. And so we can find this use case. Like, let's say you're harvesting table grapes. You can build a map that you use for an hour. Like, you can navigate using vision for an hour, and then the sun moves, and then you can't, right? But if you need to use that map for an entire day, that's a new problem. So, like, we're finding the simple cases we can solve first, learn how to solve the harder ones. Now we have all this data. So now we can learn how to solve the harder and harder problems. So certainly it's been, you, you pick the simplest thing you can do. Um, I think, like, kind of, where my focus has been as well is not like how do I solve or implement this specific thing. It's like how can I not implement that and still solve the problem. It's almost like how can I not do the code. So if I if I can not code an algorithm and still get a product or a solution, that's like that's the best case because building robots is hard. So yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, I've been like. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for the seminar. Um, uh, my name is Anse. I'm a first year MCIT student with also agricultural background in my undergraduate study. So maybe I've missed this because I joined halfway the seminar, but I would like to ask, what was your vision when you first started your company in terms of like competition with those already established like agriculture or robotic like big companies such as like Bayer's or whatever um, and finding your place in the market? Yeah, well, I can, I can take it. So um, our vision is a combination of um, wanting to re remove the really laborious tasks that people are doing in the workplace. Um, that's one. The other vision um, is to build technology that people can use. So anyone can use, and it's simple to use. And then those kind of two things together, one is you have this robot with a touchscreen interface that has a few buttons and you can you can set up to add value. And two is we found this in, in this industry which was really desperate for um, kind of automation and uh, augmenting the workforce. So I don't know if you want to add to, add to that. Yeah, uh, yeah so, so I think on, maybe on the competition side, there's this book, The Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, I think every, anybody who's pondering a technical product should read. It is hands down the best framework for how uh, uh, innovation kind of happens in a variety of industries. I think uh, large companies build better products at higher margins for their best customers. And so if you're a large incumbent and you build a bunch of uh, large machinery, you will tend to be trying to like take a big tractor and make it autonomous or make it more autonomous because that's what the best customer is asking for. We've gone after a customer base that doesn't have any mechanization uh, and because there's no mechanization, there's nothing in the field to automate. But because there's lots of people doing work, there's lots of labor cost. And so almost by design, the initial market that we've chosen has no competition in it and also has a lot of labor costs, which is kind of in a way what we're competing against. And then separately, when you're working with labor, you can do a lot of really simple things or seemingly simple things initially to build the foundation for a system that works safely alongside people. And 
almost every single competitor that I see in the space today will have a, a scene in their demo video that shows a robot stop when it sees a person and shut down and then resume movement when the person walks away. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of at odds with the premise of robots working alongside people where there are tons of people, there's tons of labor. So that'd be like a, maybe a quick couple of thoughts on that. I think on the, on the question, I might have missed the, missed the thread, but that's kind of how, how I might look at it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I also wonder like a follow-up question. That's really interesting. Like, um, you know, at agriculture, there's like, you know, plant agriculture or like crops, I, or crop agriculture, but there's also the animal agriculture side of the uh, air, air industry. Like, how did you guys like prefer one of the other or like, maybe you also introduced it in the beginning. Sorry, I missed it, but just would, I would be really interested to know, like, how did you choose between, you know, plant agriculture versus animal agriculture and that sort of things? Um, so sorry, I'll, I'll, I think that's, that's, so that's we, a you question. Yeah, that might be a you question. Maybe question. Um, so uh, animal livestock, dairies are the big ones. Uh, that is already heavily automated. There's uh, Lely, uh, there, there, there are a number of other companies in that space. We just kind of avoided that one completely. Um, chickens, pigs, some of the other stuff, I think are maybe at odds with where I kind of think the world should go with more population. Um, I'm sure there are things that one could do in that space. I actually saw with a company recently build a, it's a thing that that goes around a pig's neck that prevents it from rolling over on its piglets and killing them. And like that, I'm sure that's a great business. I don't really want to build that. Like I'd much rather build something that's like in keeping with where the world is going. I think that our team broadly speaking, you know, the, the world is going to go more towards crops as opposed to livestock if population continues to grow. So we've tried to stay ahead, you know, on that side. And then this final point is that like, we're ultimately an autonomy company starting an ag, not necessarily an ag autonomy company. We've just chosen the areas where we see the most demand for mobility in a work in a in a segment that we can tackle today, but kind of with an eye towards where it might go as well. Mm, got it. Thank you so much. Any other questions? I don't know. We might also be out of for overtime. That's not sure. Yeah. Um, is there some thing that you see Good question. Um, uh, programming. Get ready, ready, get a program. Do lots of it. Like in what, in what sex? I think it's like that. People that do algorithms are very different than people that are doing software engineering. It, right? It's it's both. So like, it's like if you're building a computer vision algorithm to I don't know, detect something. Sure, that's part of it. But maybe that can be, become part of a system. Um, so maybe you want to put put it on the robot. Try put it on a robot and try to get the robot to drive around. It's trying to take take something cool, like very specific, then and then apply it to something which maybe other people have done a ton of work with. So like you know you go and look at stuff people have done with Ross. It's like a ton of stuff. Um, so so maybe I can do something that's very aligned with my own research, and then integrate with something else, um, and then by by doing that you'll Get a lot of kind of hands-on experience with uh, different projects, writing code, things like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question. Like how, particularly when you're very focused on research, is how to or kind of focus on, on programming. It's like it's if you want to do, if you want to go and program a slam algorithm, you need to know how to program. So, it's, yeah, that would be. And probably internships. Probably it actually might be the best way of doing this. It's for internships. Go and do like a software development internship, robotics or um, wherever, and get like with people who are really, ex really experienced at it, like no C plus plus, like no architecture done. Might be good experience. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. So, if anybody, if I guess we're we're local. If people ever want to swing by, we're like ten minutes away from here. Uh, so most of our team is here as well. So if anybody wants to advise, please let us know. So I thank you for the time. All right, all right. Yeah, thank you for sticking around for the party lines. Yeah, absolutely. We much appreciate it. Um, yeah, no, we, to the question, we are always hiring. <laughs> so. Thanks for the questions. Yeah, thank you.